Good morning, Tower Hill Church Online. I'm Pastor Jason. It's so good to be with you again today as we're starting this new sermon series on the Gospel of Mark. In fact, this series is going to take us from today all the way until Easter. Now, if you've seen this graphic before the last two years, you know to sort of hold your breath, right? Breaking news. That means we interrupt your life to tell you this thing that has changed everything. This thing has disrupted things, and now everything is different as a result. Breaking news. And I feel like every time I see this breaking news graphic or something like this, I'm just like holding my breath. So what's the new awful thing that I need to be worrying about? Breaking news, right? The CDC is changing their mask and their vaccination requirements, or they're uh, changing quarantine. And, you know, we're just dealing with this with schools right now. And it's like such a moving target. It's like, oh my gosh, what new thing? The new variant or something. I'm just waiting for the CDC to be like, yeah, we have our new mask recommendation that you will, you know, look like Bane from Batman. Or it's like not even to do with the pandemic, but I mean, oh my gosh, the situation in the Ukraine and the tension that's there and the fear and the anxiety over these nations that are just kind of on the brink of battle. Or you look at natural disasters like what happened in Tonga, and it's like, oh my gosh, can we get any more bad news? Well, apparently we can, because last week I saw this, this article pop up on my feed. A huge kilometer-wide asteroid will pass by Earth today. Great. That's great. That's just great. That's all that I need. Breaking news. Yeah, okay. It's crazy, and no wonder why we're so anxious and we're so fearful and we're so nervous and we're so disoriented because everything's constantly changing and it's very, very disruptive. And breaking news usually is synonymous with, here's another horrible thing that's going to change your life. What if it wasn't a horrible thing? What if the breaking news that changes everything is a news that saves your life? This just in, everything has changed. And because of that, you're going to be saved. This is the beating heart of the Gospel of Mark. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. You know, this Gospel was written, and it's, it was very unusual, because it was the first one that was written, and there was no such thing as a Gospel form of writing. This Mark it, invented it, and it really sh shows us how the breaking news of God changes everything. Well, first, let's talk a bit about the history of Mark and the Gospel of Mark. And yes, it was the first one that was written. It's believed to have been written between the years 60 and 69 AD. So roughly 30-ish years after Jesus died and rose again. Which makes sense, because if you were an eyewitness, or if you were around during the time of Jesus, you wouldn't need somebody to tell you the story. You would have heard it. You would have heard all about it, probably. Especially in an oral uh, storytelling tradition, like in the day of Jesus, it would have been, you know, it, wildfire. Everybody would have been talking about it, and certainly they were. But, you know, you fast forward another 30 years, and maybe the details get a little fuzzy. And so there seemed to be a need to write it down. What did Jesus do? What did he say? What does it mean for me? And so the Gospel of Mark is written with that in mind. So it's believed to have been written prior to the fall of Jerusalem. And the reason is because it's not mentioned. The fall of Jerusalem isn't mentioned in the gospel itself. And so they're kind of, scholars can figure out fairly precisely, you know, within 10 years, when it was written. Could have been written earlier, sure, uh, but most likely within this kind of 10-year time frame. Then it's, well, well, who wrote the gospel of Mark? Who is Mark? Um, and, you know, there's some kind of scholarly debate about that. I don't know that it really matters. It Was it Mark? Was he a disciple of Jesus? And he would have written this maybe in his old age or is, was it this person that they think maybe John Mark? Was he a disciple of Peter who learned everything from Peter and wrote down, kind of dictated what Peter said? In the end, we don't really know. But we do know this, that it was a brand new genre that was formed. A new way of saying that everything had changed. Breaking news. Everything has changed because of Jesus Christ. And let me introduce him to you. And it was a book that was primarily... Uh, written with Gentiles in mind, or non-Jewish people. Why? Because Mark, throughout uh, his book, 
t- explains Jewish customs. And you wouldn't have to do that if you were writing it for a primarily Jewish audience. So these are some things that we know about the Gospel of Mark. And interestingly, Mark is often the book that Bible translators translate first because it's the shortest of the Gospels and it's the easiest as far as the language goes. And in fact, Mark's gospel is very action-packed. It really moves along. You'll notice how different it is from the other gospels. And uh, and Mark was written first, and it's really like all about, and then this happened, then this happened. And the language uh, in in the Greek, um, I forget how many times it's written down, but when when a new thing happens, it usually says something like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. So it's like, Really, he, Mark moves the story along. There's not a lot of kind of sitting and thinking theologically about it or pondering about it like we get in the Gospel of John. We really get, Mark just sort of gets to it. This is the breaking news that's going to change your life. So the first verse really acts like a title to the book. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. The good news. This is from a word, that the word here in the Greek is euangelion, which is translated good news, and it's also where we get the word gospel from. And it's a derivative of a word that, uh, from the word messenger, right? This is the good news. And euangelion, in the time of Jesus, it could have meant personal joy or victory. It could have been political joy or victory, but a lot of it comes from military terms. The good news, the euangelion, is something that would be shared, like, for example, if you um, were in, in a war, somebody from the front lines will come back and notify the emperor, we have won. That's the good news. There is victory. And so what Mark is doing here for the very first time is applying it to Jesus. We have good news of the most ultimate victory there ever was. Breaking news that changes the world. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. What exactly did we think, or what did Mark think was the breaking news? Well, maybe we need to take a step back and understand it in the greater whole. That, you know, we just mentioned that volcano in Tonga. I'm like, oh my gosh, I couldn't even imagine. Um, Or the tsunami that happened because of the volcano even. But you think about a volcano and the amount of ash that gets dispersed. I don't know if you saw some of those pictures. I mean, they were just absolutely terrifying. But volcano ash creates a barrier between you and the sky, right? It engulfs everything. It covers everything. And the sun doesn't even get through. It is just horrific uh, to be living under this volcanic cloud. And... I believe that Mark really, he's coming from a place of understanding that sin has engulfed all of creation like a volcano ash cloud, right? It's touched everything and is a barrier to God's light. But breaking news, something has changed. Something has changed because of Jesus, that because of Jesus, the kingdom of God has broken through the darkness, that it's possible to see and to receive the light of God. The kingdom of God is growing in the midst of, Of all the ugliness around you, this sin-broken world, everything has changed. Hold on just a minute. This just in, everything is different. All right, let's keep going. Verse 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, this is really important because immediately what's Mark doing is he's tying in the events of this in-breaking news of Jesus Christ with all the tradition that came before. So it's to make sure that people know this is Jesus was in continuity with the voice of God throughout history. This isn't something new. This is something that's completing uh, the thought from the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament scriptures. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, when I used to read this verse, I didn't realize that it was saying something about John's spirituality. I thought it was just sort of showing that John was crazy. Like, 
He was a crazy person out in the wilderness baptizing people, but I guess I guess that doesn't make sense because if you were crazy, why would people come to him? Um, although I don't know, maybe people are flocked to crazy people. Hmm, where's that happened before? No, yeah, never in human history. Anyway, uh, so John's out there, but really, um, it wasn't that he was crazy. He was an ascetic, and ascetics use and this isn't just in Christianity, but this is in a lot of different religions where uh, asceticism is about self-denial and living frugally as a means of spiritual growth, spiritual development, spiritual purity. So John's out in the wilderness preaching and baptizing. There are some who believe perhaps he was a priest uh, of some kind, that um, that there was this sort of... Uh, classification of sort of priests at the temple and then these other priests who thought that the religiosity of priesthood was something to be avoided. We're not really sure. What we do know is he was a prophet. He's out in the wilderness proclaiming to uh, prepare for the way of the Lord. And um, he's eaten locusts and wild honey because that's what was available to him as he was living his life of faith out there. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. And so clearly we see that John, he knows who Jesus is. He gets it. He's like, this one is coming and you have no idea. This one is coming. You think I'm important or do you think this is spiritually meaningful for you? Just you wait. I am the prelude. I am the appetizer. Wait until you get a taste of the meal of the one who is to come. He says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. That's a wild image, right? Heaven being torn open. That's a very violent sounding move. Heaven being torn open, Spirit descending like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. What is the breaking news here is that heaven tore open in order to reveal the Son of God. The kingdom of God is breaking through in this person of Jesus Christ. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. He was, in, he was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Isn't that interesting? We don't get the longer version of this like we get in Matthew's gospel. We basically get the end result, and that is what? Satan was no match for him. Yes, uh, exactly what happened, right? So John says, I'm going to baptize you with water, and then he's going to come baptize you by the Holy Spirit. And then we see it kind of acted out in Jesus. Um, John baptizes him in water, but we see the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus. So kind of both are happening for him. And then immediately he faces evil itself and conquers. In fact, Satan is just simply no match for him. And this is really setting up what Mark wants to get at, that Jesus wasn't just kind of this ordinary teacher. Jesus wasn't just another in a long line of faithful people or even prophets Jesus was something else. Jesus was the victor in this battle between good and evil itself. And Satan was simply no match. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So right away, I mean, very early on in Mark's gospel, we see you know, Jesus, the Son of God, revealed he is the power of good over evil. And his very first move is to say, it's time. It's time. Breaking news. This just in. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Turn away from your sin and believe the good news. You don't have to live like this anymore. You can receive what God wants to give you. Jesus' self-proclaimed purpose is to deliver this good news that everything has changed. Heaven is tearing open for you too. Isn't that a wild thought? Out of God's love, heaven is tearing open for us. It is breaking in to the sin-broken world. Now, what's fascinating too is right after this proclamation that, hey, Jesus has come, he's going to do God's work, 
it's wild that the very next move is that he calls disciples. Why is it wild? Because you sort of get the feeling that, I mean, obviously, if God's all powerful, he's powerful over sin and evil. Why doesn't he just go do it by himself? Because we were always a part of the equation here. And this is a really important moment. This is the calling of the first disciples. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. This is incredible on so many levels. First of all, a rabbi doesn't just go up to random fishermen and say, you know, come join me. That's just not how the process worked. Usually the people flocked to the rabbi and had to sort of go through an application process, if you will, in order to study with the rabbi. They were the best of the best, the best and the brightest. But if you, at this point in your life, had learned a trade, that, that was just not something on the table. You weren't book smart, if you will. You went off and you learned a very valuable trade to support your family. And so here's Jesus approaching these fishermen and saying, come, follow me. Follow me. I'm going to send you out to fish for people. And in that, we really get the sense that Jesus doesn't just come to call like the best and the brightest, you know, per se. He calls the ordinary person. He calls everybody. He calls people who have maybe even been looked over in order to carry out this life-changing, breaking news. But I think this is really important to notice here in this call process is he calls them and at the same time he says, I'm going to send you. This is the piece, I think, of Christianity in America especially um, that gets lost. I feel like it's kind of like the NFL draft. Now, listen, uh, maybe your team like mine is no longer relevant in the NFL playoffs. And so I'm already thinking about the draft. It's going to be great. We're going to get it. Um, and when you, if you ever watch the NFL draft, it's a really kind of fascinating process is that when it's time for each team to draft, they usually have kind of the top prospects are there in the room and they have their cell phone with them. And then they, if they're going to get drafted by a team, they get a call. And then you see them kind of, you know, holding their ear and kind of listening. And, you know, the, the coach or the GM is saying, we're going to draft you. Do you want you ready to be part of our team? And, and they say yes. And it's one of the biggest. I, I love watching it because you can just see the joy and the excitement on these uh, draft prospects' faces when they get drafted. It's like their whole life has changed because they got that call. Uh, but then it, it doesn't end there, right? It's not just... Hey, you got the call. Congratulations. Here's a hundred million dollars. High five. No, they join the team. They become part of things. They learn the, the game plan. They learn the book. They learn the players. They, they do spring training. They do off-season training in order to prepare for the season ahead. And then they do what? They play the game. It doesn't matter if you're called and drafted and signed up. And then what happens if you never play? You never actually contribute to the purpose to which you were called. And for us as Christians, I think part of the problem is we forget to play. Listen, all of us are called, not just pastors or teachers. We aren't the ones who are just called. All of us are called on purpose for a purpose to proclaim the breaking news, the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. I was uh, on social media, you know, researching. And, <laughs> and uh, this interesting um, post came up from Twitter. Uh, of somebody taking notes at their session meeting. So a fellow Presbyterian had just basically said, well, you know, session meeting. The pastor opened in prayer. We did a devotional from Daily Bread. Uh, someone talked about the finances, and they think that it's the same slide from the last meeting. Uh, and then we talked about... Uh, people complaining about how political the pastor's sermon was, and then we kind of closed in prayer. Listen, if this is really the life of our church, and we're just sort of talking about who's running coffee hour and and all that, we're not playing the game. We're not in. We're on the team, but we ain't doing anything. 
I think churches have made themselves irrelevant by sitting on the bench like this. We have to understand that the call of Jesus Christ is a call to change our lives and to join him on this call to fish for people. You were called for that purpose. The creator of the universe. Can you just imagine? Just imagine for a minute. Your creator comes up to you and says, follow me. You're going to help me proclaim this news to the world. I'm going to change your heart and life. And you're going to be a part of changing hearts and lives of others. And I think for us now, you know, we think about it as a very abstract idea of following Jesus. Because he's not here physically so we could follow him. But the Christian life isn't just about agreeing with Jesus. It's about actually walking in his footsteps. Living living what he's teaching us, living a transformed heart and life for the world to see. So then after he sort of states his purpose and he gathers, starts calling disciples, we start getting proof to the world that he is who he says he is, that this good news is really good news. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. There it is, authority. And of course, talking about spiritual authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Again, we see this command he has over evil. Satan is no match for him. There is something about Jesus that we can trust he can handle anything. He is the victor, the one who is going to finally dethrone evil and sin and give us the opportunity to receive the kingdom of God. So what does that mean for us? You know, Jesus goes on the rest of chapter one and he does some healing. We see the good news of God. It brings healing. It brings joy. It brings peace. It brings wholeness. It brings forgiveness. It brings everything that is good. The good news of God is is great news. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean for you today? This just in. You don't have to live in darkness anymore. That volcanic ash of sin that sort of clouded everything. Now, we just choose to live that way sometimes. You don't have to. Jesus has made a way to break through that, to show you light and life and healing, to get rid of the evil that is slowing you down, that's clouding your vision, and to make you new. You don't have to live in darkness anymore. Second, repentance enables you to receive what God wants to give you. Right? What's the key that unlocks it? It's faith and repentance. What does repentance mean? It literally means, the actual literal meaning is to turn away from. You're turning away from your sin and saying yes to Jesus Christ. And then third, if you're called, that means you're also sent. I think all of us need to remember our sentness, not just our calling, but our sentness. No matter what your occupation whether you're a minister or you're a farmer or, you know, an accountant, whatever that looks like for you, you're called. You are the one that Jesus came to and said, drop your nets. You are the one that Jesus came to and said, follow me and I will make you fish for people. So my question to you and to me sometimes is, are you just spending too much time on the bench? Are you even in the game? What would it look like if you started, started to join Jesus in his mission of healing to the world. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. 
It's breaking news. And maybe that even has a double meaning. It's not just breaking urgent news. It's breaking news in that it's breaking the power of sin in your life and in the world. The breaking in of the kingdom of God. I pray for all of us that that's that's what we make our faith and life about. Amen.